So I, I, just a, a word for the audience, I changed to the computer with the wrong colors because I can't uh, connect to the Skype on the, on the other computer. So uh, Kelly is from George Washington University and he's the, doing work on big data, uh, text mining. So Caleb, the, the floor is yours. Excellent. You can see the screen? Yeah, very well. Excellent. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, you know, this, this quote, uh, you know, that any fool can tell a crisis when it arrives. The real service to society is to detect it in Africa. Uh, you know, this, this, this quote really went to these words, in Isaac Asimov's foundation series. I was fascinated by this vision of cycle history. Although we get these massive data and computers for the past present forecast the future. This grand vision that machines could take to us to take to save us from that. It makes sense about the old computer. What if the earliest glimmer everything from wild pet found from new disaster, epidemic, genesis? Um, you know, and Asimov specifically emphasizes things that could become this whole scheme. Um, that's an individual, the society as a whole. Understanding what makes us tick and fair shape of changing things around. Well, Caleb, Caleb, just a second. Um, maybe try to speak slower so you'll, you'll fit the speed of the internet. <laughs> you'll be speaking too fast for the internet connection. Okay, okay, thanks. You know, to find a subtle among the obvious, a skill that no human could understand. To tell the untold stories from around the world. Gail offers us incredible new lenses through which to see our world. When we talk about mapping the world, we typically mean social media. Billions of tweets coalesce on a map to form an image of society in motion. Their languages tracing national boundaries. Their clusters, transportation corridors. The connections among them trace the communicative and cultural center points of a globalized society, showing us who and what we talk about. But this image is critically incomplete, especially when it comes to conflict. When a scud missile was fired from one country into another, social media may light up on one side, but remain utterly dark on the other. Blinding us to all those, all that brightness on one side, blinding us to all the views we never hear on the other. And our view of the world through social media is not getting any better. Twitter has been geographically frozen uh, since July of 2013, entrenching the places it was then, but not expanding much beyond it. And this is critically important because as social platforms like Facebook and Instagram are exploding, um, they're, they're also simultaneously not very accessible to us as common researchers. Whereas the data sets that are easy to use on Twitter um, are really retrenched, or at least not getting any better. News media, of course, isn't any better. Um, it itself is extremely biased. Um, and if you think about, you know, historically, uh, when we look at data sets like uh, you look at things, for example, uh, you know, historically, conflict research is really historically focused on a relatively small set of outlets, uh, mostly English language, Western outlets. But they have an incredibly skewed view of the world. Um, you now, it's, it's worth noting that the bias is that see in media tend to mirror um, the public interest of the world. The countries that the media don't talk about um, are also the country in, in each country, are also those countries that people in those countries don't search about. Um, now, this is, why is this important? Um, obviously, as, as Tom Richter can see here, uh, you know, we'll of course understand this, um, but it's also this, this critical question of if we can do a better job of capturing all this data. Can we move beyond scholarly study towards actually using it in real life? Um, to find it. Um, and it really raises that question that if we have sufficient data, could we make things like cycle history real? Um, you know, could computers not only tell us what's happening, but forecast the future? Um, you know, in 2011, 
the Harvest Volkswagen 50.0 that showed that my 100 billion people homes are at fault, including, including specifically leopard the finality and geocoding, um, could do incredible things for understanding society. The problem was, at the time period, there were data sets that could give us a real-time view of contact across the planet. And it's worth noting that when I first started Complex Day, I was dumbfounded how much of the complex data was the country year or at the, at the best case, country day. Saying that Syria is in conflict or had protests yesterday, it's not a terribly useful thing. And that was really the vision that led to the GDL project, was this idea of being able to combine this, this data literature data that surrounds us from news media to academic literature, books, television, human rights, and imagery um, to really understand society. Um, and today, um, GDL comprises 3.2 trillion data points spent in 200 years of global society. Um, you know, the world of information offers an incredibly rich landscape in which to understand the world. At the same time, however, the majority of this information is in a language other than English. Looking at English isn't enough. We're at a point where machine translation, obviously far from perfect, is good enough, though, especially when we think of it you know, the, the machine translation that we use today is really more akin to interpretation. Um, the systems that we use are much more the translation process. This idea that algorithms directly work with the translation engines to see the totality of the possible interpretations of a given piece of text. So they can iterate and say um, that, for example, this country has you got the pursuit of gold, and to know that in German, this is actually a euphemism that can mean an airstrip, to be able to restore that ability there. And translation is crucially important, because as we can see here, understanding, say, the Yemen conflict, if we only look at English sources, we're getting only the most minuscule view of that conflict. Um, and it's astounding to me how much of the conflict gave us that today are still only using English for a small number of sources. Now, obviously, translation is really expensive. Um, FBIS, which obviously has a, has a rich history and complex faith, um, in itself, most people don't recognize that that's expensive. Given the U.S. intelligence community, seats here, much of the continent of Africa, Central Asia, a lot of the areas of, it, of great interest in the lot that we um, are not monitored through local sources. They're monitored through the sources of other countries. For example, what Spain and Portugal are, and Portugal are saying about Africa. Uh, what China is saying about the Middle East. Um, and this is, when we think about even the U.S. intelligence community, failing to fully understand the biases there. This, this, this is really important that we use forces to understand the world. We, we really engage media scholars that can really help us understand um, the biases in the data we use. Now, you think about this fire hose of data from GDOP's perspective, fire hose of data that's arriving every moment, being fast machine translated from um, 65 languages, soon to be 100 languages. What can we do with that? So, obviously, the classical uh, event coding, taking a uh, sentence and bringing it to a dot and app. And that map you're seeing here actually you know, is during the um, Egyptian Revolution, in the second uh, point of Keaton. Um, but one of the things that's been very interesting to me, um, when I first became involved in the conflict phase, um, a lot of colleagues um, outside in, in the governmental, the corporate space, um, that actually make decisions. So you think about a lot of public research for academic scholarship, or governmental use that's sort of putting them map out of their um, you know, to say, hey, look what the future we might be able to do. Um, but those who are in the decision-making space that uh, actually are advising and say, there's where to send the troops. Um, here is a country that needs to be interrupted. Or here's a country that's destabilizing. Uh, let's address our, um, our resources there. Well, by the time there's conflict, 
it's sort of game over. Your goal was to, is to understand where conflict in the brain might occur and before it actually happened. Um, and that's sort of where inheritance and emotions come in. Where you want to understand that in this country, uh, you know, before Hanks were rolling in the streets, that the people really turning the government. And this is where the latent dimensions of information come from. Um, now, of course, this being uh, a conference focused on geography conflicts, textual geography um, is, is a huge issue. Um, you know, we have an incredible gap that's here today that blanket the country, or sorry, blanket the world um, with recognized location. The issue, of course, is that when we see a reference today to Urbana in the U.S., um, what Urbana is that? Of the 13 Urbanas, what are we talking about? Um, and so disambiguation um, is really the, the root. I mean, think about textual geocoding, or sorry, full text geocoding, which is very distinct from address geocoding. Full text geocoding really relies, I mean, there, there's candidate selection. Um, candidate selection, you know, that's, that's a lot of, there are a lot of processes for. It's, it's the actual disambiguation, understanding some context, which of these locations am I referring to? That's really where geocoders fail or succeed. Um, and this is a really interesting map. This shows us the percentage of locations in each country that share their name with another location in that country. If you think about it, if every place on Earth had a distinct name that was not, if there was only one Urbana on planet, only one Paris on planet Earth, geocoding would not be that difficult. Um, but as we see here, our accuracy varies by country. Um, they, um, um, it's about how many places that there are in that country that share that name. Um, and this is really important because full text geocoding takes back to the punch part there. But most of the modern systems that are out there are not a whole lot more advanced. They use more sophisticated technology, including deep learning approaches. Um, but in terms of that, they're for how they're treating that process how they're leveraging those contextual views um, is not that much different. And most of these geocoding systems do decent, decently well or acceptably well on large cities, but they fail when it comes down to small kill pop. You know, uh, a few years ago, we worked with the mapping the Mars proposal. And one of the difficulties aligned with GDEL with all these other data sets is the majority of these other data sets coding everything as Mosul. But there wasn't quite a proposal at the time. They hadn't reached Mosul yet. And so one of the challenges of this project was Gino was kind of all this, all these events and all the kitchen ground um, versus all the other data sets were pretty particular in Mosul. Um, and this is obviously really uh, complicated to be a uh, uh, conflict from a geographic standpoint because so many of our data sets code things this largest New York City. Um, and a lot of that also because they use Western sources. The New York Times assumes its readers don't know the geography of Syria. So they'll say northern Syria or north of Aleppo instead of the actual location where it's occurring. But it's also important to note, humans don't do much better. We like to think of humans as a gold standard, but having one huge number of projects involving humans, uh, humans themselves, unless they grew up in an area, they're not familiar with that geography. They'll go out and they'll do a Google search. They'll do a Wikipedia search. They'll say, well, the top hit when I search in the city here, this is the top Google search, so this has got to be the right city. Um, without stopping out of all this content there. Um, and that's a real problem. For example, if you see Georgia law papers passed in law yesterday, um, a lot of American papers will just code that as the US state without ever even thinking what they're in the country over there in Europe. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, certainly there is a lot of precision data out there. So, you can annotate and put a precise level to longitude there. Um, the problem is that the people, the universe of people that go into a Wikipedia page and annotate the precise latitude and longitude is really skewed to the U.S., of what, Eastern U.S., and Europe. But if we look at the textual geography of Wikipedia, it's far richer. And this is, again, one of the challenges we need to really focus on technical geography. 
Um, it's also pretty important to note today, we have tools that can all this imagery around us and geocode that imagery based purely on visual recognition of the background of that image, down to which corner of the street the photographer was standing on. Um, now, of course, using this data, we can do all sorts of things. Human stability curves, map things like refugee migration. Um, but this is actually really interesting uh, because there's been some, some, some incredible focus by using GDL to map real time refugee inflows and outflows um, that actually, um, the ground truth against ground collected data um, is actually lines up incredibly well. This is actually really interesting when we think about um, the geography of conflict. Um, of course, we can think of mapping more traditional processes. Of uh, conflict, um, or, uh, you know, actually unlining the, the look, the look things like emotion and geography, um, whether that's filtering the emotions of a particular country, or uh, our domestic discussing that country. Geography has uh, huge impacts there. Um, um, Caleb? Yes? Um, uh, me, uh, you have three more minutes, but maybe. Sure. Um, maybe it will be good to uh, just to say in a few words what the GDL database offers people and uh, maybe to have one or two questions from, from people of how can they use the GDL database. Yeah, I've got four more minutes. Why don't I cover a few more of these slides? Okay. I think they are important okay. today. Um, so being able to do things, for example, especially being able to look at the reaction to things, for example, things like the Silk Road Initiative. Um, being able to use this data at a precision level to look at things, for example, the cycles of history. Um, but it's also important today, the, the overwhelming majority of conflict research is based on text. And it's very important that we move beyond that. Um, GDEL today has processed more than half a billion news images from around the world. And this allows us to actually reach inside of that image and ask, for example, on um, the violent, for example, violent events that have occurred by the country. Or what, how we see conflict, when we see conflict, is it through the impact on humans, or is it through purely um, the, the aftermath of that? Being able to look at things like emotion through humans, being able to look at how the world is reacting to them. For example, the election of the leader, and how across the world that, that they're portrayed. Or being able to use imagery to ground things, like, for example, natural disasters, and watch as they emerge and ground the impact of that very. Um, or measure, for example, environmental impact through this. We can, we can get really interesting by looking at, um, to date, over the last three years, um, just, in three, just in the last three years, you know, has monitored more than 850 million articles. It extracted 7.2 billion references to a place on Earth, um, and almost two trillion uh, more, one and a half trillion emotions. We can cross the data with a single line of code. Um, we can take all that data and for two minutes, take, for example, a map of local happiness. Um, or look at the geographic networks of how these locations are, are interconnected with each other. Um, and this becomes very powerful as we start to look at things, different contextualizing examples. Of the people, places, organizations that are involved in conflict. Um, and you know, if we think about it in particular, you know, we're wrapping this together, you know, Gino's really about uh, this idea of taking the world information, open information, um, whether it's news media or you know, whether it's news media to reflect the real time data, um, whether it's books to look historically, uh, academic literature to behind the flat. Um, and imagery to allow us to see conflict in the lenses, um, we're really at this incredible point in society where we're able to really visualize the world around us in real time. Um, and Gino in particular, um, you know, certainly we, we work with, and we certainly you know, work at the um, but Gino's focus really is on production, um, is on being able to understand the world, the world especially with decisions. So much of conflict is based on academic scholarship looking at high-level abstract views of the past. Instead of saying, we actually have to make a decision today. Uh, for example, with a lot of key organizations have to be able to move the people out of harm's way. Uh, and this is really important. We need to look at a geo is, you know, how do we look at things like mass machine translation to understand society? 
Um, how do we make image in the cup of research? Um, how do we ask the question, social media, is the data that we can get from social actually reflective of, of especially complex spaces, not downtown Manhattan? Um, and so really, at the end of the day, it's really about using data to reimagine how there's a society uh, from the active conflict to the narratives of the future conflict, um, to understanding um, the, the past the present. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just a few words. So I go to I somehow googled and found about the GDOT project, and uh, it's a global uh, global database that uh, allows you to freely allows you to uh, uh, get uh, geo coded, temporally coded uh, event state data. Um, yeah, there's event data. There's basically event data that is classical event data. Uh, but more and more, um, people are using it to build their own events coding systems on top of GDEL. We have a number of things that are coming out that allow you to build your own systems on top of it. So if you have your own, for example, protest extraction engine, you can run that on top of that. But also the narratives, um, the motion, the image, we have just an incredible number of data streams, front page scanning, just a full text search. This is huge number of data sets of all the open data available uh, for, for research. So, so I just uh, wanted to have uh, to, to expose the, the public here, uh, those who don't know about the Gido project, the Gido project that they go online, Google the Gido project, go go in and see the wealth of information that you can use, the wealth of data that you can use for studying whatever region in the world uh, that you want. So um, thanks very much, Caleb. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, and we'll go back. Uh, to our local speakers here. Okay, Great, thank you. thanks. Bye.